So I am so glad that all of you have joined us today to talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion in water and water science. I am Sherry Westbrook, as most of you know, the director of the NSERC Create for Water Security program and a professor in um, geography and planning at the University of Saskatchewan. I'm hosting the webinar today from my home in Beaver Creek, Saskatchewan, which is Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. The format is going to be a jointly delivered presentation by Drs. Corin Schuster-Wallace and Andrea Rowe, followed by an open period meant for questions for the presenters and general discussion of the topic. Today is just one small piece of a larger conversation about equity, diversity, and inclusion that the water science community must have. It is only through uncomfortable conversations and changes in our actions that we will make progress on fixing things that are broken. Our presenters today bring a wealth of knowledge and experience, and I thank them for sharing their views today. Dr. Corin Schuster Wallace is an expert in water, health, and well being. She is the Assistant Director of Global Water Futures, a professor in the Department of Geography and Planning at University of Saskatchewan, and an adjunct professor at McMaster University, Queen's, and Waterloo University. Corin has a broad experience um, at the Water Health Nexus, including linkages with gender, climate change, and sustainable development. Prior to coming to USASC, Corin was a senior research fellow in the Water and Human Development Program at the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment, and Health. Also, importantly, Corin consulted to the Provincial Commission of Inquiry into the Walkerton drinking tragedy of 2000 that many of you will remember. Dr. Andrea Rowe joined the University um, of Saskatchewan through the Global Institute for Water Security and Global Water Futures as the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Specialist just this September. Andrea is one of the original co-founders and Chief Research Officers at um, Feminuity, an evidence-based research-driven firm specializing in EDI in the tech sector. Andrea has a PhD in comparative public policy from McMaster, where she researched gender equality in national innovation systems in Canada, Sweden, and the OECD in Paris, France. So with that, I will turn over the webinar to our guests. Oh, thank you so much for uh, Cherry for that lovely introduction and uh, for inviting Corin and I here today. Uh, thank you very much to NSERC uh, Water Create and GWF for making this uh, opportunity possible. I just want to give you a brief uh, overview of today's talk. We have, I think, 40 minutes and uh, you'll have to keep us on track here. Um, today, Corin and I have sort of divided this up where I'll begin by speaking a little bit about the key concepts in equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, talk a little bit about what's unique about equity, diversity, and inclusion in 2020. And talk about inclusive leadership in water research. And then I'll turn it over to Corin, who's going to talk a little bit more about people and water and how EDI relates to water security uh, and intersectionality. And then we're happy at the end to have some uh, time for conclusions and questions. So I really wanted to begin uh, my portion of the talk by just talking a little bit about what is equity, diversity, and inclusion. Because there's a lot of academic definitions out there, there's a lot of different ideas about, well, what does EDI mean? And I wanted to just give some really practical thoughts on what EDI means to me in my work. And so equity to me is really about, you know, understanding a historical context. And being uh, able to understand, you know, are the social, political, economic factors in a given situation the same uh, in each place? And so equity requires continuously challenging historically accepted ways of doing things. And it's about really giving people the resources that they need to be successful, rather than giving everyone the same types of tools and supports. In the university context, a term that you may be familiar with is that of equity seeking groups. And recently, you know, this has sort of been redefined as equity deserving groups. And you'll notice how that small shift and change in language has a profound impact on the way that you think about equity. And to me, diversity is a relational concept. No one person can be diverse on their own. Uh, we're diverse in our identities, our experiences, our relationships with each other. 
Uh, and so you may have heard, you know, in a, in a negative or a pejorative way, someone being called, you know, a diversity candidate or a diversity hire. And this isn't the right way to think about the concept of diversity because that assumes that all of us are being measured against a, a norm, which in the past may, may have been white and male and heterosexual. Whereas if we think about diversity as relational, everyone is part of that diversity. Uh, and so uh, it's important to understand that this conversation includes everyone. And then inclusion relates to the quality of the experience that people are having. And I've put here in your work environment, but this can also be at home, social environment, et cetera. And so creating an inclusive environment means anticipating that people experience the world in different ways and designing different experiences to reflect those needs. And there's sort of a continuum in terms of inclusion. For example, when we think about folks with disabilities, some people think about compliance with certain legal requirements or, or legislation. But there's a, a company in Toronto called Return on Disability Group that helps companies to achieve what they use as a metric called surprise and delight, which is at the other end of the continuum, which is how do you make people really feel included by making sure that they have the best possible experience. And so in addition to this, those de definitions of EDI, I also want to introduce the concept of intersectionality because I think this is really critical to understanding the approach that uh, we're taking at GWF and the most current uh, up-to-date approaches in EDI uh, in, in the literature, which is the concept of intersectionality that was coined by American scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. Uh, if you haven't watched her TED video, it is uh, linked in this presentation and I strongly recommend uh, that you, you watch it. But intersectionality is essentially a prism or a lens or a way to understand how people's multiple and overlapping identities and experiences uh, impact the way that they experience life. And the idea is not that because one has multiple overlapping uh, identities uh, that this is problematic. It's that systems of power and structures and hierarchies impact people differently. And so there's research to show that leaders who use an intersectional lens make better decisions about policy and resources and that an intersectional approach can also lead to more innovation. Because when you introduce all of these different variables, you know, people's age, their physical abilities, gender, race, ethnicity, parental status, thinking styles, and then we think about how power and structures impact people differently in those ways, we start to come up with much more creative ways uh, of handling issues or challenges. So for example, if a person wanted to design a healthcare program uh, and they were designing it for women, that could look quite monolithic. But if they took into account, you know, I'm designing this for a woman who is Jewish, who identifies as queer, who lives in a rural setting, uh, who has a cognitive disability, and you assume that that's one, one person, how would all of those experiences um, affect how they access this healthcare program? you'd come up with a much more complex and nuanced system that impacts people differently. And so one of the things that I really wanted to draw your attention to is that equity, diversity and inclusion in 2020, uh, it, it has been a transformative year, I think, for EDI. And I've pulled together here just a, a sample of newspaper articles just from the last uh, year, but even the last few weeks and months that raise some of the issues that we are, are talking about in EDI. This is no way an exhaustive list, but it's just um, designed to think a little bit about the fact that, you know, this year the Black Lives Matter movement uh, has made, you know, an incredible contribution uh, to the world of equity, diversity and inclusion uh, following the tragic deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Uh, they have, you know, raised awareness about the tremendous injustice that black people face. Uh, and also they have been supported by many communities, including indigenous peoples that have also drawn many uh, parallels between the injustices faced by black communities and indigenous people, including uh, being disproportionately impacted by uh, lack of water, uh, clean water, and also um, climate racism. And so I think it's really important to acknowledge the, the contribution of activists and the work that they have done this year to raise awareness about how important EDI is. And I think it's also important to realize that there's so many um, positives that are also coming out of what has been a tremendously painful year uh, for many people, which is that now people are also getting more recognition and being um, uh, seen in ways that they may not have been before. And one of the articles that I really liked uh, was the article about um, uh, 
uh, Barbara Hillary, who was the first woman to, the first black woman uh, to go to both the um, Arctic and the Antarctic. And, you know, she was very passionate about uh, showing that women and black women in particular are interested in polar climates and interested in traveling to extreme uh, destinations, et cetera. And so, you know, raised money for those journeys and wanted to show that, you know, black women do belong in these spaces. And I think, you know, the, um, it, there's been work on the fact that disabilities are not a, you know, a nice to have tick box. That these, you know, understanding and designing for people with disabilities is really like fundamental to solving the UN SDGs. And so I think that part of what we learned in 2020 is that EDI is moving us forward in so many interesting ways. Um, and new words and new ways of thinking are also uh, emerging. You know, uh, environmental racism has become, has not, it's not a new term, but it's becoming much more commonly used, uh, even by mainstream media outlets to describe, uh, for example, the, the oil spill that happened in the, in the story in the right hand corner, and climate anxiety as well in young people. You know, increasingly, uh, you know, psychiatrists have found that young people are really str struggling with climate issues. And so uh, this is something that also needs to be addressed. But there's also socioeconomic issues in the postdoc survey that are impacting the ability of folks to participate in academic work. And, you know, the struggles of many communities and many people to fit into STEM, including women of color and LGBTQ scientists. So there's a lot of issues. You can see that a lot of issues and, you know, exciting things and difficult things that we need to think about when we talk about uh, EDI. And so with all of that in mind, you know, one of the, the questions that we want to ask is, well, how can I be part of the change, right? How can I be part of making a difference, uh, you know, as a water researcher, as an academic, a student? And so part of what, what I wanted to talk about is the fact that diversity is organic and equity and inclusion are intentional. So there is more diversity in the world in terms of our, you know, various backgrounds, our humanity, our experiences than we could ever quantify. But if we want to create equity to make sure that people are treated fairly and get the resources they need and are included, uh, then we have to be intentional about that because it doesn't happen organically. It's something that has to have you know, consistent uh, focus. And so part of that begins with ourselves, uh, having a, a strong self-awareness of who we are and our own identities and how you know, our own identities and backgrounds shape our ability to have empathy for others. And I think that, you know, for many folks, especially in Canada, if you are not an Indigenous person in Canada, your family has an immigration story. And so part of, you know, growing in your understanding of EDI is thinking about your own, your own past and how you can uh, be more empathetic uh, for others around you. And part of that self-awareness is understanding your privilege. Because although this is a, a, a concept that deserves much more attention than we can give it today, um, you know, understanding your own privileges and, and the privileges that you have, it's not about being frozen in a state of guilt. It's about understanding that you have privileges and that other people don't get to necessarily enjoy going through the world in that way. And so it's your responsibility where you have privilege to uh, open those doors up for other people and to extend other people the same experiences that, that you have. And of course, self-care. Because a lot of the people that are most active in equity, equity, diversity, and inclusion work are those people that are most likely to have been impacted by trauma, experience of exclusion, et cetera. And so part of participating in EDI work for many folks is actually honoring that your comfort, your safety matters in this. And so um, you have the responsibility to yourself and also the right uh, to, to take care of your own health and well-being. Uh, and that we recognize, you know, you can't pour from an empty cup is the, the common phrase, right? That, you know, you need to be able to sleep and to take care of yourself and eat well and all of those things to be able to, to give to others. And once you understand yourself, there's the concept of allyship. And allyship involves a lot more than what I've mentioned here, but it's not a title uh, that we want to hold and say, I am an ally. It's a set of actions that you need to do repeatedly uh, to, to be an ally. And part of that is active listening. You know, it's really listening to what folks are telling you because if people are sharing their experiences of being excluded or experiencing, uh, you know, uh, things that are not, are not right, it's, it's being able to listen and, and to write those things down and to reflect them back and to really hear what people are saying. And then also not only listening, but holding space, letting other people have the opportunity to speak 
and to really notice who's present and who is absent in a room. Uh, and so if you notice that there are people that should be included but aren't speaking up and, and taking action on that. And finally, I think it's really important as individuals that we embrace complexity. As you can see from just the brief overview of news stories there, equity, diversity, and inclusion isn't fitting into one sector of our work or one sector of our lives. It's personal, it's professional, uh, it's environmental, it's social. And so we have to recognize that, you know, improving an EDI is going to take a long-term sustained commitment. Uh, and that the connections between people, the climate and the economy are accelerating faster and becoming more complex uh, than ever before. There's a book by an author, Thomas Friedman, that, that I've linked in there. It's not a new book, but he talks about how we're in an era of acceleration. So I think it's a useful way to, to think about managing the complexity that we're facing. And so I want to, before I hand it over to Corin there, I wanted to talk a little bit, well, what does that mean in terms of inclusive leadership in water research? And I think it's really important to be clear that to me, leadership is not a title. It's not about holding a certain position in an organization. This leadership is important, whether you're a student uh, or seasoned in the field. It's an attitude and a state of mind that we're all being called upon to lead in equity, diversity and inclusion in our lives, whether that's at home or at school or at work. And so part of that, it, it, part of what I think, you know, we need the qualities we need to move towards as inclusive leaders um, it's around redefining professionalism. In the past, professionalism has been coded as sort of white upper middle class standards, uh, you know, and the ways that we're rewarded for showing up and being in the workplace often were rewarded for looking a certain way uh, or conforming to certain European standards. And I think that part of changing that is really thinking about, you know, professionalism now is being the kind of leader who is inclusive, uh, who is able to hold space for others, who is able to design, you know, work and experiences, you know, inclusively and so forth and so on, who is respectful above all else. And so prioritizing those things that really matter over uh, an appearance or, um, so, you know, certain standards uh, of being. Design thinking I've mentioned a couple of times uh, and I've linked a, a resource here um, from Stanford University that's about, you know, designing with inclusion in mind from the start and consulting, uh, providing opportunities to consult and opportunities for feedback. That what's really difficult is trying to map inclusion onto experiences or ways of being that have always been done that way. Uh, often this doesn't fit that really we need to rethink the whole process uh, from start to finish for it to actually be inclusive rather than just tweaking existing ways of working. And I think some of the real benefits of being an inclusive leader are absolutely innovation. You know, uh, there's a, a long body of research to show that people that are more likely to innovate because of their own experiences. And so part of that is, you know, recognizing that, for example, a lot of the, you know, the technology we're using today in this call actually comes from the disability community uh, and the way that people with disabilities have adapted technology for their own needs. And finally, I think inclusive leaders need to be able to take a systems-based approach and that a lot of the inequities that people experience feel um, highly personal and like one-time events and the people that experience them in the moment often feel profoundly isolated. But leaders need to be able to recognize that these individual experiences um, are not isolated and be able to turn those experiences into system-wide change. So with that in mind, I'll pass it over to Corinne who will um, talk a little bit more about how all of this relates to water. <laughs> exactly, so why do we have to be concerned about it? And the basic answer is that in the same way that we have multiple identities as individuals, we also intersect and interact with water in very, very different ways. Water is essential for life. So at a foundational level, we all need water. But water is all about transportation. It's about industry. It's about energy. It's about our spirituality and our mental health. We have connections to water. Um, we use water for different purposes in different parts of the world. And we also have it for our economic base. It's something that we use to just basically our basic hygiene. Uh, we flush our waste away. We dilute our pollution in many respects, even now. And so when you start thinking about the different ways that we interact and intersect with water, and you think about our 
individual identities and the multiple identities that Andrea referred to, then we can start putting this into more context. And a lot of what I'm going to say is not going to be rocket science to you. It's something that you're all aware of, but I hope that by putting it within the context of equity, diversity, and inclusion, that perhaps you start to think about it differently and think about your role in water and as a future water leader differently. And so the first basic statement is that water is not evenly distributed around the world. And we see this in the next map in terms of rainfall patterns. And you can see that we have very dry areas that are lighter and we have very wet tropical rainforests that are much darker and purple in color. We have places where the precipitation falls predominantly as rain. We have areas where precipitation falls predominantly as snow. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that we also have different areas where there are different water stresses. This is just in terms of natural supply and irrigation demand, but you can see how different parts of the world are facing different levels of water stress. And so in addition to this, water infrastructure and access are not evenly distributed around the world. And so if we look at people who have access to basic drinking water services, then we can see that we have inequities. Basic drinking water services as defined by WHO and UNICEF are a protected water source. So some kind of fence or a, a concrete wall or some way of, of pseudo protecting it. It doesn't necessarily guarantee the potable quality of the water, but at least it protects it to a certain extent. And that's within 30 minutes round distance. So that's essentially, if you figure that it's 12 minutes to walk a kilometer, it's within a 500 meter distance from your home and you don't have to queue. That's basic access. So when we look at this map and we see countries where 25 to 50% of people don't have basic access, then think about what that, what that looks like. And I've given you a couple of photos from communities that I work with in East Africa to give you a sense of what that can look like. It's not just drinking water. As I mentioned, it's the waste that we generate as well. So when you look at sanitation facilities and actually equitability in access to sanitation services is far worse than drinking water, as you can see here. And so the people without access to basic sanitation services, which again is a household based ventilated improved pit latrine or better. And so it's not exactly a high standard but you see that there are many, many people around the world who don't have the luxury of a flush toilet in any way, shape or form. And again, you can see some images representing some of the public toilets and the other toilets, the non-toilets, if you will. The photo on the left is a hanging toilet. So literally the whatever waste falls into the river and eventually it gets washed away. On the right hand side, the lady that showed me her toilet was very proud of the fact that she used mosquito nets. Um, but this is the state of her toilet and she uses the mosquito nets to protect her two year old child. But again, doesn't see that sanitation could also be a potential killer for that child. And before we start getting the wrong idea, this is not a low and middle income country problem. This is plumbing poverty in the USA. Who's more likely to lack complete plumbing? It's the uh, American Indian, the Alaskan native households, it's black and Hispanic, it's those living in mobile homes and it's renters. And they're anywhere from almost one and a half to over three and a half times more likely to not have a full plumbing system, which is from tap to toilet, essentially. If you go to the next slide, I'd just like to think about that within the context of COVID-19. So, when we look at healthcare facilities, forget the households where we need to be able to clean services and we need to be able to practice uh, hand hygiene and we need to be able to protect ourselves and our families. If we do get sick, then we go to a healthcare facility and more than 20% of healthcare facilities in these 69 countries had no water service. And they also had very little limited sanitation services. If we go to the next slide, and so you can see that 10% of healthcare facilities had no sanitation service. And they also didn't have 
proper hand hygiene facilities at the point of care. So more than half of healthcare facilities lacked hand washing facilities at points of care. This is not only relevant for COVID-19, this is relevant for any infectious disease, whether it's localized or whether it's a global pandemic. Next slide. And so the other piece that I want to point out here is that threats from water quality and quantity are not evenly distributed around the world. So when we look at a map of natural disasters, then we can see that there are significant variations in the last 20 years up till 2015 in terms of the number of natural disasters reported by country. And what we don't see when we see a map like this is what it means. And so you can see a map from one of the BC floods. Uh, you can see the devastation that the Jane and Finch Bridge washing out had the impact that it had. It took, I think it was nine months, it might have even been longer to fix this. But not only was the transportation affected, but look at all the buried infrastructure. You've got sewage lines, you've got water lines, you've got gas and electricity all going through underneath the road. And so it's not just the inconvenience in terms of not being able to get from A to B or fire engines, ambulances to not be able to access. And the bottom two, I was working with a Garifuna community in St. Vincent and they had a microburst literally three days before I was meant to go and stay with them. And so we had to stay elsewhere, but you can see the complete devastation. The man in the house, luckily he got out. He was pulled out of one of his front windows by his neighbor, but it also struck during the middle of the night. And this is because many of the upper steep slopes are being deforested and used to produce marijuana plants. And so as a result, you just don't have those ecosystem services to slow down any heavy rainfalls. And so it just all washed down. And so you can see even a car ended up on the beach and that beach used to be beautiful sand and now it's black. So again, think of the tourist implications for that community as a result of these disasters. Climate change. This is from Canada's Changing Climate Report by NRCAN. And you can see that we are not experiencing climate change in Canada to the same degree as each other. And you see that in Northwestern Canada, we've got two to three times the rates of warning, warming that we're seeing. Well, think about the implications for that on permafrost, on infrastructure, on roads, on ice roads, and start thinking about the people who live there and, and what that can mean over the long term. This is the, the last one that I'll show you in terms of the, the differences. And it is the map. I don't know if anyone's seen there's something in the water. If you haven't seen there's something in the water, I strongly recommend that you watch it. It's on Netflix. I believe it's on other uh, platforms as well. But it's the movie that Ellen Page made. And it's also based on Ingrid Waldron's research. And this map represents the visualization of what they already knew and the stories that are being shared in the film by three communities. And that is that waste disposal facilities, thermal generating stations and other toxic industries are far more likely to be co-located with First Nation communities in Nova Scotia and with African Nova Scotian communities than they are with others. And these also coincide with some of the more socially deprived. And so the colors on the, the background of the map are actually a social deprivation index. And the darker the color, the greater the social deprivation in that region. And so you can see that who you are, where you live, actually dictate some of your interactions with and threats from water quantity and quality. And so Andrea mentioned the environmental racism and it was introduced by Benjamin Chavez, a black environmentalist back in the 1980s. And he talked about racial discrimination in environmental policymaking, the enforcement of regulations and laws, the deliberate targeting of communities of color for toxic wastes facilities, the official sanctioning of life-threatening presence of poisons and pollutants in our communities. But on top of that, it's not just the the government actions and, and, the, and the environmental policies, but it's actually the exclusion of people of color from leadership in the, eco in the ecology and the environmental movements that were seeking to redress the environmental challenges that were being faced. 
And so lastly, I just want to point out that solutions don't benefit everyone equally either. And the example I want to share with you for this is First Nations drinking water in Canada. And you'll see on the chart from the Government of Canada, there's been a commitment by March of 2021 to eliminate the long-term drinking water advisories in First Nation communities in Canada. And you'll see that they have brought that down as of February of, of 2020 down to 61 communities on long-term drinking water advisories. These long-term drinking water advisories, what that means is that either you cannot drink your water or you have to boil it before you consume it, before you clean your teeth, before you bathe your children, before you prepare any foods. And so the fact that it's long-term means that it's been in place for at least 12 months. Imagine 12 months where you cannot use the water in your tap in the way that you and I trust us, ourselves to be able to use it. And even though these it's a long-term drinking water advisory after 12 months. Many of these have been 5, 10, even up to 20, 25 years on these drinking water advisories. The other piece that I would point out is this map of long-term drinking water advisories is only communities south of 60 degrees, and it's only communities that rely on the federal government for financial. So there are Saskatchewan First Nation communities that aren't included in this. There are British Columbian communities that aren't included in this. And so when we're thinking back to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, again, which Andrea brought in, the fact that 99% of Canadians have safely managed drinking water access, that's not universal access. That's not access for everyone everywhere. And 1% of the population, that's between 360 and 370,000 people. That's bigger than the size of Saskatoon. And these are the people we're talking about. These are the faces that we're talking about when we're talking about intersectionality and water. And I just wanted to put a quote up of Biggs and MacArthur because the challenge of ensuring drinking water for First Nations reserves, it's persisted not just because of lack of technology, but more to these deep institutional issues. So the question is, what can we do? Well, I'd argue that better data, better research design, better research, better knowledge mobilization are going to lead to better policies, programs and practices. And for those of you who are sort of saying to yourselves right now, well, I'm not going into academia, I'm not going to be doing research. Research is not all about universities, it's not in the academy. Research is all about consolidating information and generating evidence. And we need evidence-based decision making. And so I would argue that at some point in our lives, all of us are going to be undertaking research beyond our graduate degrees, whether we end up in academia or not. And the question is, who is collecting the data? Who is asking the question? What question is being asked? Who isn't asking the question? Who isn't collecting the data? Who isn't being consulted when we collect the data? Are we collecting data from and having focus groups at three o'clock in the afternoon, which is a time when mothers may be looking after their children or picking their children up from school, where people may be in the workforce where younger people are in school. So who are we excluding based on when we decide to collect the data and what data we collect and going to what data we collect? What are the variables? Who's defining those variables? And, and, and who is going to interpret the data when we get it? We talk about qualitative versus quantitative. And the fact that yes, quality, quantitative is far easier to work with, but it doesn't give you the why. And when we're talking about intersectionality and water, then we need to know that why. And we need to know who is counted and who isn't counted. And we have to figure out how to do that. We have to figure out how to engage the right people, how to make sure that we're, the, the way in which we're reporting this is not going to create inadvertent harm for anyone. Uh, how do we, mobilize the knowledge so that it can actually benefit marginalized groups and equity deserving groups rather than further oppress them. How do we reach different people? Do we translate our findings? Do we put our findings into podcasts so that people can hear them? Do we create posters so that people who have hearing impairments can visualize it? 
Do we, you know, how do we make what we're saying accessible and particularly accessible to those who are going to be most impacted by the work that we do? And so finally, as part of agreeing to, to take on this, I wanted to think about water security and intersectionality from my research, but also in terms of the EDI expertise that Andrea brings to Global Water Futures and to the Global Institute for Water Security here at University of Saskatchewan. And so this is a framework for water security, for local water security, that we co-developed with Indigenous communities, with First Nation communities in Ontario. And you'll see that there are the standard elements of local water security. There's the water resources themselves, there's the infrastructure, the environment. We need to think about industry and economic bases. We need to think about threats and we need to think about water diversion, but we also need to think about health. We need to think about spiritual and cultural nature. Uh, we need to think about community. We need to think about equity. And you'll see at the top of this schematic that it's very much our historical context and how we are looking at change in the future and the community needs and the just the, the knowledge and the strengths that exist within a community, uh, even though they may not be as water secure as other communities. But the other element I want to bring your attention to is the outside square. And yes, drinking water, access to drinking water is a human right, but very much embedded in, in many Indigenous worldviews is that there are responsibilities that come along with any rights. And in terms of commodifying water, we really have forgotten some of those responsibilities that we hold as individuals, as communities, as, as groups, in terms of ensuring local water security, ensuring the sustainability of our water resources. And so just to pull it all together, what does it look like when we look at intersectionality and water security? And this is a, a paper by Thompson from 2015. And the quote is that human experience is constructed at the intersection of both social and ecological systems. And I've always described myself as a coupled systems, using a coupled systems approach to water related health. And so I started teasing out what that meant in terms of status and, and EDI from, from Andrea's perspective, but also then the water security that I've been working with and, and sort of defining and, and operationalizing in the research that I do. And so I've shown you how we've got low and middle versus high income, rural versus urban, uh, there's ability, there's age, there's sex and gender. Uh, in East Africa, the women are responsible for water fetching. And if you are not as physically abled, whether that's short term or long term, then being able to provide for yourself and for your family becomes problematic. In COVID-19, how do you self-isolate if you still have to walk 30 minutes to go and fetch water for yourself and your family? And how do you physically distance when you're queuing at a water source which may run dry? So all of these pieces come in, in terms of water availability, water quality, washes, water sanitation and hygiene access, uh, water fetching, the ecosystem services, but it's our access, our use and how we value it. And again, there was a Women on Water lecture series last year and uh, an economist came in and talked about how we value ecosystem services from a very specific North American and, and predominantly male perspective. And so we don't look at diversity. And yet the people who are the most impoverished, the people who are most marginalized, they are the ones that use ecosystem services the most and that they rely on these ecosystem services the most. And then just water related disasters, water sector employment. Again, in East Africa, a lot of issues are set up for women because most of the people working in the water sector are men. And so they can demand sexual favors in lieu of payment for water. And it does set up a very different power differential than if the water sector was more diverse in some of these countries. And then finally, water management and governance. And so Andrea and I would like to leave you there with our thoughts in terms of 
the importance of EDI institutionally, but also then how as water researchers, as water advocates, uh, as water experts, we really need to see that intersectionality and water are actually quintessentially combined and, and that we need to think about them in our work and not just in our homes or our, our institution or in our daily lives. Thank you. Clap, clap. I always find it weird that we can't all just clap and, and you can hear it. Um, there are just so many things to talk about after such an excellent presentation. Thank you to both of you. I think uh, it might be best to start by opening the floor to questions. Um, I can't see everybody, so I will figure out how to make that happen. If you have a question, pop in, ask. Did I mute everybody accidentally? <laughs> I have a question. This is Cobb. Um, and this is not directed, this could be Karine or Andrea, whoever. Um, uh, just about within Global Water Futures um, as, a, as a research organization um, and, and within the, um, I guess the, the structure of, of the organization itself, um, what are some things that we as, as um employees or we as researchers or parts of this community um can um where are some places that we as a community can improve in terms of our um our uh i guess our inclusion and um equity thanks Cobb. Uh, i'll hand it over to andrea because Andrea's, even the fact that Andrea is here is the start of us trying to make a difference. And so both Global Water Futures and the Global Institute for Water Security recognize that we need to be doing more. And so I'll hand over to Andrea, but one of the things that we are setting up is a strategic plan to really start framing out what we can do and in terms of sort of three different areas. And I'll, I'll hand it over to Andrea to explain a little bit more about that. I'm sorry, I'll have to ask you to just repeat your question briefly. I got muted there when I was stopped sharing. Can, could you just uh, repeat the question for me there quickly? No problem. I'm just looking to, um, I'm just curious your, your thoughts on within the organization, within Global Water Futures, what we as um, parts of that organization can do to contribute to a more equitable um, organization? Yeah, so I, I think that there is lots that can can be done. And I think that, you know, the interesting part uh, uh, about equity, diversity and inclusion is that I think it's really important to actually take a systematic approach. And so as Corin mentioned, part of the work that I'm doing now is developing uh, a strategic plan that at some stage will go out for consultation. Uh, because this really is about all of you and the work that you do and your experiences and the change that you want to make. And I have a lot of experience in putting together strategic strategic plans for organizations of all sizes, from startups to Fortune 500 companies. But ultimately, equity, diversity, and inclusion should touch every area uh, of that you work, uh, in everything from, you know, field work and teaching to uh, hosting events, uh, you know, to the very questions that you ask in research, to the way that you share the findings. And so part of what I'm very interested in is working with you all to develop capacity and your own knowledge, uh, you know, growing, because there are people in the network that are experts, that are world 
experts uh, in various aspects of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And then there are people that are really uh, just starting on this journey. And so I think part of having a, a strategic and you know, well thought out approach is being able to in include everyone. And that there is absolutely a role for everyone to play in, in helping make um, GWF as a network, how we work internally, and then also the research that we bring into the world more equitable, diverse, and inclusive. And to add on to that, Andrea gave some specific examples as well. We've talked about being better water colleagues, and that is something that we will be working to develop. And that means that if you see something that's inequitable, that you actually speak out, whether you speak out at the time or whether you go back to the person and say, hey, not sure if you realized, but that was not appropriate or uh, don't know where you were coming from with that. So calling out bad behavior, but also then providing spaces for people who've been marginalized because often in academia, that's the lack of voice. And so you'll have people who commandeer a meeting, you'll have people who speak over others at a meeting. And so even just from, a, if you're in a position of power, being able to say to that individual, uh, to say, excuse me, I think so-and-so, had something to say. And so that's some of the, the institutional environment, if you will. And then from the research side of things, even if you think that your research is disconnected from people, if it's about water, what I hope you've taken away from today is that it's not disconnected from people. And so even if you're doing a computer model, even if, you know, it doesn't matter what aspect you're doing, just ask yourself, what are the implications of my research, even if it's not the it's not me applying it, you know, how can this be applied? How can I make sure it gets applied in a way that supports equity deserving groups that does not further marginalize individuals? And it may not be part of your research, but at least then it will inform your approach and it may change who you talk to or it, it may open some doors or ideas. So again, not thinking about the research that you're doing in isolation. And, and thinking about how it will connect, even if it's eventually in sort of two or three graduate students beyond you, how will it end up connecting with society, with people, and, and with very different identities and, and sort of combinations of identities? There's a question um, next in the chat. Uh, first of all, it's from John Pomeroy. He said it was a groundbreaking presentation. I agree with that. Um, he is wondering how we can better promote equity in fieldwork, particularly in a time of COVID, because it's something that GWF needs to provide guidance on, and certainly on the various professors that are on the call. Absolutely. Andrea, did you want to, to start with that? I know you've been having some conversations <laughs> with people about that. And then no I'll small questions to today. Yeah, no small questions today. <laughs> so yes, I have lots of sort of high level thoughts on this, uh, you know, that are things that uh, ideas that of course need to be explored in a more fulsome way in this network but you know in the in a, um, the the news items that I chose you know one of the news items there was you know women in the Arctic who were told to uh, wear um, different clothing not tight clothing because there had been a sexual harassment incident uh, you know on, on an Arctic expedition and one of the things that really struck me was you know how poorly that was handled at the time but also how if you really want to create equity in that environment it has to start way before any journey or field work begins. And I think that one of the things that has to become, you know, routine is really an explicit um, approach to what are the code of conduct and, and standards of behavior uh, for field work. Because I think assuming that people just know how to act or just know what is considered acceptable uh, is, is assuming uh, it's not the right assumption because people do come from all over the world and different backgrounds and different environments where different types of behavior uh, is acceptable. And so I think it's really important to actually lay that out for folks and give them the opportunity to, you know, read something and review it and, and having, you know, that be mandatory before you head out into the field that you know what is expected of you. And it can encompass the, you know, behavioral aspects like, you know, anti-harassment, but also in terms of health and safety, right? You know, what is it that you need to know to be healthy and safe in this space? And part of that, you know, is about inclusion. We're talking about students with disabilities, for example. Are there ways that they can be meaningfully included in field work? Or are there ways that they can be meaningfully included in the research uh, that doesn't involve field work because, you know, going, for example, to a glacier might not be possible for, for many folks. And so, 
it, it is about making those conversations more routine uh, and more explicit, I think is really important. And so drawing up, you know, a thoughtful code of conduct, conduct is something that I think is going to be really important, you know, uh, as we move along this journey. Uh, but I think that's, that's part of it. And I mean, even dietary requirements, those types of things, you know, can people's dietary needs be met or in where things cannot be met for whatever reason, because of you, the fact that you're working in extreme environments, for example, part of EDI is letting folks know that those requirements can't be met. And so it gives them the opportunity to um, figure out for themselves, well, how am I going to handle this? Because as I mentioned before, people that are struggling with a challenge or experiencing something are the most likely to innovate it. Uh, and so, you know, giving people as much information as you can uh, so that their expectations are realistic about what, what can happen and where there are risks realistic, you know, for example, with COVID, what those risks are and allowing people the opportunity to decide whether or not, you know, going on field work is right for them uh, at, at this time, given the risks, because everyone's risk tolerance in a time like a pandemic may be different. Someone who doesn't perceive themselves to be in a high risk group might be willing to take more risks than someone who, who does. And I'd just like to emphasize that EDI is not about everybody being able to do everything. It's about being given the opportunities to either try and figure out a way, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, but it then finding alternative ways for someone to have a meaningful engagement, even if they can't go and do the research, but also making sure, as Andrea said, that impediments that exist right now, such as dietary restrictions uh, that people will see as a barrier for them to going on field work, which actually maybe shouldn't be a barrier. And so it's about removing the barriers that we can and finding other ways for people to meaningfully engage in in areas where we can't remove those barriers. And so it, it's, it's not about accommodating to the nth degree, it's about having those conversations to make sure that there's respectful engagement. And, and as Andrea said, that, um, that everybody's on the same page in terms of what can be accomplished to make sure that the experience is the same, even if the way that that experience is gained is not the same. Are there other questions people want to ask? There's another one in the chat. If not. Tariq Manir writes um, that he appreciates the great talks today. Um, I, he said, I think we talk about systematic equity, diversity and inclusion. Any ways we can bring about um, equity, diverse, diversity and I think he meant inclusion. One thing I will say that I've learned from Andrea is absolutely and that it's going beyond the institutional sort of frameworks. And so we have these institutional regulations, they differ. And if one thing we can see from Global Water Futures is the variation and the emphasis that the different institutions, University of Waterloo, Laurier, McMaster and the University of Saskatchewan put on aspects of EDI that they either are pursuing at the moment or that they're emphasizing. And so, again, having that as a framework, but recognizing that those are the regulations, those are almost the minimum standards. And so it really is about empowering yourself and others through knowledge, but then translating that into action. And even if it's individual actions or like GWF and, and GIWS have sort of moved beyond those individual actions to a collective action through the hiring of Andrea. Andrea. Go yes. over to you for the details. <laughs> yes, I mean, there's, there's something every single person, no matter what role you hold, can do. Absolutely. And I hope that, you know, our strategy will be able to touch on that more fully. But for example, if you're a supervisor or professor, part of what you can do is ask students what they need to be successful. You know, well, you know, do, do a self-evaluation at the beginning of the term instead of the end of the term and ask students, you know, what is it that you need to be successful in this course? And as an, as an instructor or a leader, you can look through those lists and think, oh yeah, I could do that. I 
could do that. A lot of the things that people need to feel really meaningfully included in a space are, are very doable. They're very practical. But if you don't know that people need those things or want those things, how, how can you uh, make them available? And so part of it is normalizing those discussions without um, forcing anyone to identify things about themselves that they're not ready to share. Because that's part of this journey as well, is that, you know, self-identification uh, is really important. And so it's always about people, you know, sharing what they're comfortable sharing. But of course, the more these conversations become routine and the standard way that we work together, the easier it is for folks to share what it is that they actually need to not only be successful, but to feel meaningfully included uh, in their work environment. Awesome. Uh, Jeff McDonald writes that uh, he thinks the discussion is excellent. He mentions that the American Geophysical Union, AGU, has done some EDI training for their awards committee in particular uh, that people have found effective and useful. And he's wondering if we might do some sort of situational EDI videos um, for GIWS or Global Water Futures on uh, themes and topics related to the operations. Absolutely, and congratulations on being involved in the very first video that will be posted on the new EDI website. So, <laughs> and absolutely, and uh, as Andrea has talked about the strategic plan that she's developing, what she hasn't talked about are the protocols, the resources. We're not going to reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of good things out there in toolkits, but. Uh, again, Andrea, I'll hand over to you for the details in terms of what you've been pulling together, but the idea is to have a resource kit and some specific to GIWS and GWF, but also for water experts, water uh, researchers around the world. And so we see this as an opportunity for, for leadership as well from everyone here in this room, the virtual room, but also the larger GIWS, GWF families, if you will. Yes, I think that that's a really interesting suggestion. I personally hadn't thought about videos. So, you know, I think that's, that definitely adds something to what we're thinking about. Uh, the idea that, you know, I've been thinking about is, is the idea of case studies. And uh, for many people that have studied in a business environment, you're very familiar with, you know, case studies uh, as a way of learning. But I think that they're really important to have, you know, I think videos would be great and also some written, written case studies, uh, things that involve complex scenarios. And the, one of the things with EDI work is that there really often isn't a right answer that but part of um, getting better at EDI is recognizing that it's complex and it's contextual. And so you have to be able to slow down and to think and to rethink and to learn and unlearn. Uh, you know, I wish I could tell you there's always a right way to do things, but unfortunately there isn't. And so part of, uh, part of developing an organization that is equitable, diverse and inclusive is developing in that uh, elasticity and that ability to learn and to unlearn and to be able to say, you know what, we tried that and that didn't work and now we need to do something new. Uh, or the world has evolved. You know, I, one of the things that I always include at the end of documents is, is a statement saying, you know, the language in this document will evolve because I know it will. I've been in this uh, for long enough to know that, you know, what was, uh, what was the right um, language to use has, has changed very quickly. And so I think that's part of, you know, having case studies or videos or conversations, guided conversations is really, um, you know, I think it's important because it gives people the opportunity to learn when, you know, real lives are, are not at stake, because that's really in the work that you're doing, li people's lives are at stake. Uh, and so I think it's important to have, you know, um, training as well as, uh, you know, actually incorporating this into your work. Fantastic. I'm uh, mindful that we're almost at the end of our uh, one hour time period. We have time for one last question, um, if somebody has one. Okay, if not, I think that people probably do have many questions. Um, certainly I can send out the email contacts for Corin or Andrea if anybody does not know how to reach them already. Um, but I wanted to thank you both for starting this wonderful conversation that is so important. And um, what a fantastic talk. Uh, on behalf of everyone, I thank you both for coming. And I look forward to all the wonderful stuff that's going to be coming out on EDI and uh, through Global Water Futures and the Global Water Institute. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Look forward to carrying on the dialogue. Bye, everyone.